Dot.NZ. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Alistair, and um, sorry I couldn't be with you guys over in Auckland or from wherever you're listening in from. I'm currently out on my deck in Christchurch, overlooking the city. Oh, the, the city is lit up, up on uh, Huntsbury Spur and the Port Hills. Uh, yeah, it would have been nice to be over there in Clarin with you guys uh, face to face, but I think I had a good excuse to tap out this one. Uh, I was actually, we, we booked this date about four months ago because um, I wanted to just get the NZAC to pay for my flights up to Auckland on the way to our trip to the Himalayas, but um, that was cancelled along with everyone else's plans. So how's everyone's lockdown going? Is everyone keeping fit? I think uh, there was just a poll up there. It's actually um, a great time for this coronavirus to be hitting, actually, because I think as climbers, we realise um, autumn is probably the worst season of the whole year um, for climbing in the mountains. The, the snow is coming down soon. I think we've got 30 centimetres of fresh snow coming into the Alps uh, in the next week, which is exciting. So autumn is actually a great time to be talking about this, uh, training for the mountains, because that's um, this is when we get fit for the upcoming seasons. So winter is coming, and I think if there's one thing that I want you guys to get out of this talk, it's not numbers and workout plans and training plans. It's just a bit of motivation, uh, motivation to train, not for what's happening right now, but what is in the future. So... We want to uh, act right now, but um, there's great things ahead. I was listening to uh, Graham Zimmerman on his Facebook Live the other day because everyone seems to be going live these days, um, talking into their computers. <laughs> it's kind of strange. But um, he said he's, he's over in America. He said he's not even training for this summer. He's training for next summer, so like 14 months in the future. But I think in New Zealand, we've got a, hopefully a good chance of getting out this winter. Let's, let's hope. Maybe just in small groups, maybe not on the ski fields. But hopefully this talk will give you a bit of ideas how to train for the winter season and next summer. So just a quick introduction um, about myself. Um, I actually grew up in Auckland as well you guys and uh, I studied engineering at Auckland University that's where I got started in tramping and mountain climbing through the AUTC in ORAC is anyone from those clubs here and then um, that was a great time learned a huge amount from those guys and those in the volunteer clubs and passed on a few skills it was a really good time to learn way to learn then I went down to Christchurch for a master's in engineering, started to cut my teeth in the Southern Alps a little bit. Then I ended up getting a job in Sydney, I worked there for three years in an engineering consultancy, in sort of renewable energy uh, engineering. And and there I managed to do a half year stint in Canada, did some, got some good ice climbing in, and um, came back to Australia. Then in the, over the last year I spent a bit of time in Europe, Chamonix, and eventually came back to New Zealand, and pretty glad I came back when I did. In hindsight, um, it would have been pretty chaotic to be coming back amidst all this. And um, also in the last four years, I've been involved with New Zealand Alpine team, and that's been a real game changer for me, um, having some experienced mentors to help uh, with ideas for training, skills and just general guidance so I got a huge amount out of that so I think that's one important thing with training is having good mentors so I want to start um, why train that's, that's what I want to start out with I want to start with five reasons why training for the mountains is important so you guys have got some good reasons to get out there and keep training even while the mountains are kind of in a a whiteout right now. So that first reason is safety. So training gives you that extra margin of strength and fitness to go uh, further than you need to. So you've always got this margin of safety. 
There's the um, Yuli Shtick quote, don't epic, keep it under control. And that's coming from Yuli Shtick. So you want to stay in control and having a large reservoir of extra strength of fitness really helps you to stay in control. I mean, just think about two people in the mountains, the less fit person is going to get to that summit and a whole lot less um, of a controlled state than the fitter person. And that fitter person will end up taking charge on the descent and keeping everything under control. I think we want to try and build ourselves to be like Ferraris that can actually only operate in a 100k zone, even though we could possibly go 200k an hour if we wanted, but we want to be like so much within our limits when we get onto the mountains itself. <clears throat> and uh, this picture was from first winter climb I did in Chamonix with Dan Joel, and we got to the summit late in the day, it was 4,000 metres, I was totally bonking because of the altitude, and um, I think just having that extra bit of margin kept me in, in that little bit more control, even though I was completely exhausted, if um, we would have been turning back otherwise. And the next point is speed. So training gives you more speed, which in a whole lot of different ways creates more safety. And when I say speed, I'm not talking about running up and down mountains, which is fun, but I'm actually talking more about continuous movement. So never having to stop and not having to take breaks every hour for 10 minutes to regain your energy. So that continuous movement means you get to the summit at 3 p.m. rather than 6 or 7 or 8 p.m. And so you've got the, all that extra daylight to do the descent. I remember Jane Morris said, I don't go fast, I just don't stop. <laughs> so speed's not about the actual meters per second, it's about con continuity. So having high fitness means you just never have to stop and you just keep going. So, of course, that leads to a lot of extra safety. The third one is resilience. So that's being able to withstand multiple days of movement and training. Um, so on those longer trips, on those expeditions, you're able to keep going day after day. Maybe it's a five-day long climb. Having resilience, which comes from training, will allow you to keep going and not fade after a few days. Or maybe say you're going to Rapalese for a month. Having resilience through your training will mean you can climb a lot more days of the month and not have to take as many rest days. So this, um, this picture is from approaching McCoy Col in Southern Alps with the upper Rakai in the background. So I remember coming to the end of my time with AUTC, I thought, I've got to do, you know, you've got to do your rite of passage in the mountains doing a really long trip. So we did a trip, Arthur's Pass to Mount Cook. It's becoming quite popular these days. I think, well, I think it always has been. Um, and having those kind of long trips in your bank of fitness gives you that sort of multiple, multiple day endurance. And your body doesn't really forget that. So but we can also build that resilience by having hard weeks and then having shorter weeks. But trying to pack in a lot of training in, in a short amount of time. And that's what will give you the extra margin on those long pushes. After four or five days, you'll still be have enough in the tank to keep going. And that came in really handy a few years later, me and Rose um, Pearson. We ended up sort of, well, we hadn't really planned to do this climb. Well, she had, but uh, this was the west ridge of Tairahu. That was on the fifth day. Still seemed to be smiling, but um, that required a lot of, resilience to keep going that was the fifth day and we'd run out of food all of that so that's that comes from a long bank of of training uh, i think over the years and the fourth one is enjoyment so i think when you're fit you just enjoy the mountains more you you're not always complaining or feeling like you're tired you're you're, you're feeling fresh more more often of the time 
So you get to the summit and you're like, you're stoked. I think that's what we want to get out of the mountains is to enjoy these places. And by training, it means we can ignore that pain in your legs or your arms and you can actually enjoy the environment. This was um, oh, that previous photo that was top of uh, Long's Peak in Colorado. We were climbing some splitter cracks at altitude, about 4,000 meters. So I think that having that cardio training actually helped on that high altitude rock climbing because, I mean, you're, you're climbing these cracks, but you're puffing. So you could actually enjoy them, whereas my partner, he was totally out of shape. Uh, sorry, Josh. And he was just struggling the way. So um, it definitely allows you to enjoy the place more. This is... Um, can anyone guess where this is taken from? New Zealand. One of the most beautiful places in New Zealand, I think. It's uh, from the top of Mount Sabre, or Sabre Peak, in the Darrens. Beautiful place, Lake Adelaide below. And I mean, you get to the summer and more time to spare, and then you can really enjoy being up in these high places um, that you've worked so hard to get to. And the fifth one is progression. And do you remember the um, the video of Uli Stick when he's on the summit ridge of the Eiger after doing the North Face? I seem to always remember this. Is you want to keep moving, uh, having a progress progress in your life. And I think that's what training allows is you to keep moving forward. And every year doing something a little bit more technical, a little bit more challenging. Um, so from year to year, you're getting better, and that training will allow you to go from where you are now to where you want to be. Uh, so this picture was the first time we tried to climb this face, uh, Mount Hutton, uh, which is near Tekapo in the headwaters there. Um, and the first time that we tried this face, we were, we were well out of our element. We didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. And then we ended up abseiling off after just three pitches, so they're quite hard. But then we came back four years later and had a lot more skills skills and fitness in the bank um, and we got to the summit at that time. So it's it's quite a satisfying process when you you spend all this time consistently training, you come back to something that you failed on, in this case four years earlier, and um, you succeed. And that makes sort of all makes all that training worthwhile. I've got a question for you guys, I'm not meaning to make you feel bad, but um, I think everyone's been in this position, just feeling totally exhausted. I mean, the question is, has anyone taken more time than expected on a long approach, and then as a result you had to change your plan when you got to that hut? Or did you have to turn around on your summit day because you just ran out of time? Or do you actually decide, no, let's keep going, and you just continued into the darkness, but you found your pace was getting slower and slower as the night progressed, and feeling like you're kind of on the edge of control, and you weren't really in charge of that situation. <clears throat> I think we've all been there. This is on the, the Drew. Uh, we're doing a traverse. This is the first trip I did in Germany, and it was about 5 p.m. We'd been climbing for 12 hours, and then Dan says, all right, only 18 more pitches to the bivy. <laughs> I said, what? And um, that was that was a big push. And I don't really know how that relates to the question, but it was just that feeling of being exhausted. And there's definitely times that I've got to the Empress and we had to take a rest day because we are just so knackered for the approach. But the point is, all these kind of situations can be prevented with more and better training. So that's the goal. <clears throat> so the next question is, what, what are we training for? So I want you guys to think about what's your future objective. So is your future objective more general mountaineering? High peaks, not super high technicality but um, long vertical altitude gains, snow or ice terrain, or are you more about technical alpinism? So 
This is the Balfour face. Both photos are actually taken from the same position. Ooh. Just lost my screen there. Uh, both these photos are taken from the same position um, from Mount Graham. There's Mount Cook. So that was General Mountaineering looking straight up the Linda. She's pretty steep for Linda. But not as steep as it looks. Um, or are you looking for technical alpinism? So one of these ice routes on the um, south face, I think, of Mount Balfour. Oh, sorry, Tasman. Mount Tasman. Balfour face. Or are you more about ski touring or ski mountaineering? So start thinking about what kind of goals you have and... And if you've got a goal, and type it in the comments, tell everyone, because then um, people will hold you to that. But I want you guys to think what kind of climbing goals are the sort of thing that makes you a little bit fizzy when you tell people about them, or which mountains or routes make you start frothing at the mouth when you tell your mates at the pub. You know, you need something that's really going to motivate you if you're going to be getting up at 5 a.m. to go for a run in the rain. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to keep going with it. So we're going to think about setting those goals. You want to set both short-term and long-term goals. The short-term will keep you motivated, um, and they'll test your progress as you go through the year. But you also want some like lofty, big goals that you don't think you can achieve right now. And then you're going to have to push yourself a few notches up. You want some intimidating goals, maybe out in the future, one or two years away or more. And we're going to go through the year and think about all the different seasons of the year um, to get you brainstorming. So first is autumn. This is just time for off-season training, tramping, general sports. This is actually why I thought it was such a, a good time to have coronavirus <laughs> because there's not much else you could be doing. This is in Porongia. Um, so it's a good time for lockdown. But soon we're coming into winter, so think about all those winter objectives. What have you got your sights set on? So this is obviously familiar terrain to you guys up in Auckland, out uh, Narahoe, from the Delta Hut. Good time for climbing those volcanoes, ski touring, ice mix climbing. This is um, Jason Horrocks. If you're listening, Jason, hello. Uh, near the NZAC hut and I just brought back some memories of ice climbing from one of those cafes but there's also a great ice mix climbing down in the South Island I highly recommend you guys all to come to the Remarkables Ice Mix Festival if it's still, if it's still on hopefully but yeah think about all those things you want to do in winter write those down and then coming into spring it's a good time for alpine climbing, maybe also ski mountaineering, depending on what you're into. This is the south face of Mount Aspiring, so it's a good so springtime, late spring objective. Didn't end up climbing it because my partner got sick, so we had to turn back. Perfect weather, but that's how these things go. Um, or maybe this is uh, Kulwa Peak, so some... Spring is a good time for those sort of ice mixed gullies in, in the Alps. Um, this is Peter Dixon actually. It's always good to climb with different generations of Kiwi climbers. You get a lot of good stories. He told me all about climbing with Bill McLeod in the 1990s and uh, about how he soloed every route at the quarry up to about grade 22. What a legend. But in I know in the North Island you've got things like um, East Ridge of Taranaki and Ted's Alley. Those are good climbs. So write all those down, those routes that inspire you. And then we come into early summer, and then you've got classic mountaineering in the Southern Alps, so it's near the top of Mount Cook. Or what else have you got? I mean, all throughout the Southern Alps. It's a great time to be come down to Mount Cook, Mount Aspiring. And then up in the North Island, you've got all that Ruapehu rock climbing. So these are just sort of ideas. So this is Cloudy Peak. 
in Canterbury, do some alpine rock climbing there in the late summer. Or um, Patagonia, good time to go over to Patagonia in February, do some alpine rock. It's actually, you think of Patagonia as this ice, rimey, mushroom towers place. It's actually tons of rock climbing. Um, what else we got? The Darrens. So even if you live up in Auckland, there's no excuse not to get down to the Darrens for the, the late summer season. So this, the reason we're doing this is we're getting ideas for what you're training for and then we'll figure out how to structure your training based on those objectives. So you've got to have a, an idea of that first. So while you think, I'll just, I've got this video from the Grand Traverse. Climbing uh, Mount Cook on the Here it is. Summit Ridge. Oh, it's beauty. Start dreaming. What, what do you want to get out of your training? Summit of Mount Cook. Just um, checking some of the questions uh, you guys sent through. So Daniel Sue said, um, what's the appropriate ratio, strength versus endurance versus technique versus technical training or all of the above? So um, I think we'll, we'll get into that in the next section actually, which is we're going to start talking about your training plan. So you have to define your, your training by what your goals look like. So if you're more into mountaineering, then you really have to be prioritizing general fitness, um, lots of vertical gain. So when you go for those runs, don't look at the, the part where it says distance, just look for the part where it says elevation gain. That's your criteria. I went for a 400 meter run today or a 800 meter run. You, know? you want to get as much vertical gain in your training as possible. You want a huge aerobic base, but you also want some pack strength and some general climbing in there as well. But, I mean, if you're training to climb, say, Denali or Everest, you know, rock climbing is just for fun and general conditioning, but you want to have a main portion in there of endurance training. But, well, first, this is, uh, in case you're wondering, this is Lionel Clay on the Mallory route, uh, north face of the Equi du Midi, doing some cardio training. <laughs> There's one of the cool things about being in Chamonix, you can, instead of going up and down One Tree Hill, you can just take the lift up to 2,000 metres and then start climbing this 1,500 metre north face and then take the lift down from the 4,000 metre lift back to town. <laughs> really need more gondolas in Auckland. That's training for mountaineering. But then if you're more into technical alpinism and things like that, you're going to have to have that same base of mountaineering fitness you can have to supplement it with the technical climbing. So this is all fairly obvious, but this will help you think about how you structure the training later on. So you're going to have to add in a lot more upper body strength as well um, to get you up those steeper crux pictures. But I think with just talking about training plans, the most important thing is to keep it fun. You have to keep that training um, fun in order for it to be sustainable and therefore effective so and you, and you need to find ways to integrate that training with your lifestyle so getting all that base training that might be running to work or biking to work um, you need to wait, work out ways to keep your motivation level up so that's including friends and making fun challenges and then by maintaining that high level of fitness through the whole year, that's going to allow you to take advantage of lots of short 
notice opportunities through the air. So you want to stay fit enough that if someone says, hey, do you want to climb the south face of Douglas next weekend, then you're in that, you're already in that position. You don't say, oh, just give me three weeks to train for it. So it's, it's kind of different to other sports where you have, say, the Olympics every four years and you're peaking for that. I think in mountaineering you want to just maintain and have little peaks of fitness through the year. So just keep those kind of thoughts um, as we go through. This is all just general thoughts about training so far. This, this was supposed to be keep it fun. It's got to be fun. If it's not fun, then you might do that workout once and then you just won't ever do it again. So when you think about carrying a pack up and down Mount Eden 20 times, well, that might be okay for one session, but was it fun enough that you're going to do it week in, week out? So I personally hardly ever do any sort of repeats with a pack because it's just boring. I'd rather be, um, if you're going to get cardio, I'd rather just be running with a light pack, just only with the amount that you need. And then to get that pack fitness, go trad climbing somewhere on the weekend with like a one hour or two hour approach and just carry a double rack, you know, ropes, heaps of water, get your pack strength in places where it actually makes sense. Now, I don't want to bore you guys with heaps of like scientific theory, um, but the one thing I thought was really useful to take into all of this is um, a bit of knowledge about heart rate zones. So I stole this straight out of the training for the new Alpinism book. Uh, he'll Hopefully he won't sue me for that. But the heart rate zones is the one fundamental thing to learn about training for endurance, which is what we're going to talk about next. So um, this is all based on, this is relative, based on your max heart rate. So you can estimate your max heart rate by it's 220 minus your age, or there are some ways of working it out more accurately. But it's, it's more just a conceptual thing based on the feeling that you have at each zone. So recovery zone that's less than 55% of your heart rate. So if your max heart rate might be 190. So anything less than you know 90 um, beats a minute, that's recovery. But you, you can tell which zone you're in by how much you can talk. So zone one, your nose breathing, you know, uh, any more than that, as soon as you have to breathe through your mouth, you're in zone two. Uh, zone three, that's when you're sort of running up a hill. It's hard, but it's also fun. It's not painful. So you can get out short sentences, but you can't really have a conversation. And then zone four and zone five, you can't talk at all. You're basically puking. You know, It's that last little bit to the summit of Mount Wellington when you just do a really hard sprint. And the most important thing I want you guys to get out of this whole talk is that when you're training for mountaineering, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but 80% of your training should actually be in zone one and zone two, mostly actually in zone one. That's a bit tricky. <laughs> so 80% in zone one and two so that's actually low intensity. Um, so that's the important point. You don't need to make all of your training gut-busting efforts. You know, The vast majority of the hours of training that you do should just be relatively easy effort, and that'll allow you to recover better and just to build a huge aerobic engine. So anything from hiking or running, cycling, tramping, cardio in the gym, but as long as it's in that zone one intensity, that's actually going to build the most endurance. And I think if you're like me, I used to think, well, zone one, that's like, that's easy. How is that going to make me any fitter? But um, if you read the Training for the New Alpinism book, you realize all the physiology behind that and that there's, there's three different ways how your body grows um, more aerobically fit. Uh, the first one is you get 
by doing long duration at low intensities, you get um, more mitochondria in your blood. I think that's right. Don't quote me on any of this. You get more mitochondria, which is facilitates the energy cycle, so you produce more ATP and get more energy. Um, so that's one effect that the Zone 1 training has. The other effect is you get more dense network of capillaries through your muscles, I think. Uh, the other, the third one was uh, you, you, you get better enzymes. So you can read up on all this, but basically it has all these great effects having all that zone one and two training. And the, the function that will make you uh, more fit is, is the duration and the frequency. So doing a high volume of that low intensity, that's what's going to get you fitter. So 80% in zone one and two, and then only 10% in zone three, is basically what they say, and 10% in zone five. So, um, yeah, incorporate activities that make sense in your lifestyle. Like I said before, accumulate all those hours through things that you have to do anyway, like commuting to work or go for a run during the day. Uh, and then you do your longer sessions during the weekend when you have more time. So, I mean, you also want to do some zone three harder efforts, but you want to space them out. Maybe do those midway through the week and then do those long sessions in the weekend. But just think about accumulating lots of hours throughout the week. Uh, you don't want to binge train, get your 20 hours in the weekend and almost nothing during the week. It's got to be consistent. Um, and then also thinking about not doing as much in zone four and five. Um, you, you might read the, the Mark Twight essay called uh, There's No Such Thing as a Free Lunch. So he was one of these proponents for high intensity training. You know, I'm going to get fit for a marathon by just doing three CrossFit sessions or three um, spin, spin classes a week, doing huge high intensity workouts, but only doing maybe six hours a week. Um, but he ultimately found that that's not the ticket. You know, there's no shortcuts. You need to put in those, those long hours um, because of that reason that I said before about the physiology, that you, you do want a little bit of the zone five. That's what's going to get your heart strong. So the other thing that he says is if you train long endurance exclusively, you'll be weak and slow. It would go forever. And to go long and fast, your training program must also include strength, high intensity, and speed work to sharpen that foundation of endurance. So think about it like a, a food pyramid. You've got your whole meal, zone one, two, low intensity training, boom, huge base. You've got a ma massive aerobic base. And then on top of that, you put your meats of, you know, hard hill sessions, hill sprints. And then on the top, you've got your intervals, you know, 30 seconds hard, 30 seconds off, that kind of thing. Might, might sound a bit like um, training for athletics, but... You, you can do this without even thinking about it, you know, just going really hard one day to work on your bike. That'll be your zone five. But the important thing is to keep it specific to mountaineering. So spend as much time on the rough trails and rocky terrain. The more time you do that, the better. And the more uphill included in that zone one, the better, because you build that uphill strength. And we're climbing mountains, right? You want to be good at uphills, so the more vert the better. But, like he said, you do want to sharpen that. Um, sorry, that was all about endurance. <laughs> Missed that one. But you do want a, a bit of strength as well, depending on your objective. And that's probably, if you're a rock climber, that's probably more what you're uh, interested in training. But even Steve Horst said, let me state that simply going climbing is not the best is not the best method of strength training for climbers. So of course you want to do as much climbing as you can. Uh, not right now, of course. 
But Steve Horse said, just going climbing, not the best method of strength training. So that's actually a good time to be locked down. We can do our strength training in a bit more specific way at home. And you might think, you know, do mountain climbers need strength training? But actually strength increases endurance. So think about, say, um, if you're just training for Denali, you might think, oh, I don't need to do any leg strength because I just need a lot of endurance. But if you can't do one step up one of those, you know, up a 45-degree slope with the pack that you're going to be wearing and the heavy boots, then every step is going to be so much of your percentage of your maximum strength, so you'll get tired so much quicker. And like if you're ice climbing and you, you, you're you at a operating at 80% of your strength, you're going to get pumped so much quicker. But if you build up extra strength, they call it strength reserve, you want to be operating at less percentage of your max. So that's why, say, with pull-ups, we're training pull-ups, once you can get to 10, there's no point to do 15 or 20 once you're strong enough to do 10 in a row. You should be adding extra weight. So hang some water bottles or barbells or whatever weight you've got. Hang some weight for those weighted pull-ups and that will increase your strength. Because as soon as you're doing more than 10 reps, you're just training endurance. But yeah, I'm not going to teach you guys how to do a pull-up. That's There's plenty of material out there. But for the upper body, you want to think about pull-ups, just lifting weights, tricep dips. But then I like to also incorporate the ice axes. So doing pull-ups with ice axes because it's that specific grip strength. And you can train your lock-off strength with the ice axes. You want to make it as specific as possible. But with the dips and the push-ups, that will help train your antagonistic muscles. So one thing I learned um, in the last few years is to try and train the antagonistic groups so that the pushing muscles as much as you train the pulling muscles. And that's going to prevent injury with rock climbing and in general. So for every pull-up you do, you do one pull up, uh, one push-up to balance it out. So think about keeping yourself in balance. And then um, core circuits. So I, I just like to do six different core exercises, one minute of each, and then have a break and do that three times. That's all I do for core. And then lower body. Uh, you can do box step-ups or squats or lunges, heaps of stuff you can just do in your in your driveway. So that'll actually help a lot uh, to get strength strong for the winter coming up. What else have I got here? Yeah, so you can you can try and train at home for ice and mixed. Um, this was in in Michigan. This is like a someone created this dry tooling rig from a, I think that's a crane, a little crane. I tried um, making a little circuit at my house. So here's my little dry tooling oh, circuit. I'm sure if you guys get creative, then you'll think of lots of different routes you could do in your garage. It's, um, plenty of people, you know, climbing around the kitchen, but how's that going to actually get you strong? I think um, I was actually quite pumped after this. For the figure four, no, figure nine. Yep, that's it. I just rigged up some press of cord over the over the the roof bars. It's a handy little carabiner, I went to that, that came from. Yeah, maybe you guys can come up with something similar, but just remember, be safe. You don't want to 
stress our limited health system, you know, they're, they're going hard right now. I had a, I had a mat somewhere in there. I had a mattress, see? Yes. Safe oh, no. as. So yeah, that's strength training. Um, and then also you get a lot of that strength training from indoor bouldering when we can do that again. So been really enjoying going to Uprising Gym in Christchurch lately. Awesome gym. I, re I remember Extreme Edge in Auckland, that's also great. And that's that'll train your power, your technique. It's really sociable. So someone asked, what's the correct proportion? Well, I think, like I said, that depends on your, um, your objective. Um, but at the end of the day, just I think the, the key thing is just to get out and just keep moving as consistently as possible and do things that bring you joy. So if you like climbing more during the week than running, then just do more of that. But if, you, if your objective is mountaineering, you're not going to do very well unless you focus on the things that you need to. So a bit of a roundabout answer. And then that last thing is high intensity. So you do want to train that that high intensity as well, that's those zone four and five heart rate zones. This was um, going up Pikes Peak in Colorado. Um, I wasn't, I was at high intensity, but it sure felt like it because of the altitude. But that's the kind of grimace you should be making when you're feeling really gasping for air and those short sprints. And what this training will do is actually grow your heart muscle stronger, so it increases the pump power and that will definitely come in handy up in the mountains. Occasionally you need to go a little bit faster. And so you can train that through lots of things like intervals, hill sprints, or crossfit, you know, Tabata or circuit training classes. That stuff that Mark Twight was saying don't do all of the time. Just do a little bit, you know. It's like a seasoning on your meat and potatoes. Um... And I think in order to go truly hard, you know, to really hit those hard, um, those high heart rates, you need the right high energy environment. So I think having friends to challenge you and to push you or having um, music raging in your headphones, that'll help. Like in group classes, it's a really high energy environment. You're going to go way harder there than you would at home without that stuff. And... Um, you should also take some pre-workout supplements that'll that'll get you going. Um, just massive dose of caffeine. Take it sparingly. Just occasionally is a little bit exciting when it hits. But um, yeah, another way to do um, high intensity I've found during this lockdown is to like look for some Strava segments in your local neighborhood and um, and just go for a run where you just sort of jog from your house to the base of that segment, you know exactly where it is. So if you guys don't know what Strava is, it's, it's this app that you have on your phone or a GPS watch and um, one part of it is there's segments, so you can see there's red lines and when you run across through that segment, at the end, you'll be on like a leaderboard. You can see how fast you were compared to your mates or the whole world. And so when you know that that if you go really hard, you might end up at the top of that leaderboard, then that's going to be that extra incentive to go a little bit harder. So if you do the ones in your local neighborhood, they might be a little bit less competitive than the ones on the waterfront. You can get a little feel-good buzz at the end. And treat the ego. Um, I think um, I had one idea... Uh, for you guys in the club, you could make a, a Strava club, NZAC Strava club, and then um, every week you have like a leaderboard. You can see how much vert everyone's doing, and that like competition will push some people to, will motivate some people. But with these uh, high intensity intervals, make sure that you warm up properly. You want to have a really good warm up because you're really going to stress your muscles, and um, if you don't warm up properly, you'll end up not being able to walk for several days. 
but you, that's also why you need this huge base to put that strength training on because you need to be well conditioned for that really hard effort. Okay. And the last component, well, I'm sure there's more, but the last one I'm going to talk about is ultra endurance. So ultra endurance is when you're going 12, 15, 20 hours or more because mountaineering days, you know, they're long. I, I realized that on the first mountaineering trip I did in Mount Cook region with Owen Lee. Hi, Owen. <coughs> he, uh, we went to climb Malte Brun. The first day was 12 hours just for the approach. I was like, whew, that was tough. Got to the camp late. And the next day was 18 hours up the west ridge of Malte Brun. Didn't even reach the summit. It took us 18 hours. Jeez. And then the walkout, because we're so wrecked, took about 14 hours. So I think that's when I realized, wow, you've got to be fit to do these mountaineering routes. Um, I mean, on this trip to Patagonia that I was going to talk about, the first climb that we did, um, the first big effort was we tried to climb Torre Ega, uh, which the, the peak on the left, that's Zero Torre. And then there's a notch, and then the next one is Torrega, and then there's a notch, and then that's Ponta Heron, and then there's a notch. So it took us, I don't know, about 18 hours just to get to that first notch to climb Ponta Heron, traversing across that face below Stanhart. Um, and we got there at about 7 p.m. We'd been climbing all day because the conditions were terrible. We were getting bombed by rime. And, uh, and the face was just like a waterfall and it was, the sun had just set and this waterfall was about to turn into like a shield of rime ice again. So we just had to abseil from that notch all the way down the mountain, about a thousand meters or so, or maybe less. And that was just, that was a 24 hour day and we didn't even climb anything. But I think, uh, at first, you know, those 12 hour days, they feel really long because you're not used to it. But after you get a few years of doing these 12 hour, 15 hour days, um, it doesn't feel so bad anymore. And then you do a 24 hour day, it's like, whew, that was big. And then a 12 hour day, all of a sudden doesn't feel so long anymore. Um, and we, we felt this on this particular trip because the next climb we did was uh, Mermoz, that's Fitzroy behind us. Uh, and because the, the weather window was so short, we had to start walking in at 9 o'clock in the evening and walk all the way in. We started climbing at dawn, got to the summit around 6 p.m., abseiled down, and then because the storm was coming in, had to walk all the way out all through the next night and didn't get out until about 5 a.m., so that was like 30 hours. So we thought, oh, 24 hours, That's that was long. Now we've just done 30 hours. Then... Um, right at the end of the trip, we went back to Punta Heron, ended up being a 37 hour day. And all of a sudden that 24 hour day didn't feel very long anymore. <laughs> but the point is, if you, if you condition yourself to these longer and longer days, um, then you get used to it. You don't have to do it all the time. I probably only do a few 24 hour days a year, but your body does remember that hard effort and if you if you know psychologically that you can you can handle a 30 hour day because you push yourself um in the bush for 30 hours non-stop without sleep then when you get into the mountains and you're like pushing 18 19 hours and you're still going you're like oh i'm fine you know i've been for 30 hours non-stop so it gives you like a mental edge so i think that's important have that experience and you guys can do this in North Island or anywhere um, train yourself to do a 24-hour day so there's heaps of options um, there's lots of 24-hour row gains through the year uh, lots of, what else can you think of um, you could circumnavigate Mount Taranaki and then traverse over the summit or it might take 24 hours, 
or less. Or you just think about, okay, this weekend let's do a five or six day tramping trip, but let's let's do it in the one weekend. So that'll be two massive days with a short sleep in between. So maybe you do the length of the Kaimais or um, <clears throat> this was, anyone recognize this car park? Kaitoki, car park of glory, under the Tararuas. So that's a classic, you know, the tramping club tradition of getting a, a bus or a train or a drop off at Putara, in the north end of the Tararuas, and then tramping along the length of the range. Um, and the only rules is you had to finish it, f uh, work at 5 p.m. and then be back at work at 8 a.m. on Monday morning. So you could do something like that. Or you could do some big link up on Ruapehu. Do this trip with Sam Clark. We did uh, Ruapehu and then Narahoe and then Tongariro, one after the other. So you could make a, a loop out of that. We, we started at Blythe Hut on the south side. Cause it's a bit, that'd be cool to go up Taharangi because you could get the highest point, right? But you could start at Whakapapa, whatever. We could do like a winter day where you try and link up all the 12 different summits. You just think of different ideas. This is the first time uh, putting crampons on running shoes. Found out that was quite fun. Or you could go carbon neutral and and bike to some mountain, like however far you want to bike, and then climb the mountain and then bike back. You'll not only be building some ultra endurance, you'll also be saving the planet. Um, oh, that's the next part. Uh, my last idea was um, you could you could try and do the max vertical gain possible on one hill, and like you could either do twelve or twenty four hours on the same hill, just up and down. Um, I had that idea because while we're all locked down, right, we've got to stay local. So pick your nearest volcano. Is it Mount Wellington or One Tree Hill? I, um, I decided, all right, this is a cool challenge to keep motivated. I'll go to the, the pipeline track near the bridle path and try and do as many laps as I can to get the height of Everest. So here's the Morning, everyone. Here. Coming to you from the pipeline this is where it all starts. The great journey of gas coming from Littleton. It follows the pipe down here. It's a bit slippery. Oh, what a day for it. This is where the pipe begins. Done about 3,300 meters. Incredible inversion layer. 7,500 meters. About to hit up the Lotsi face up to the South Coal. Thousand eight hundred forty-eight meters. We're on the summit, baby. Time to go home. Yeah, it was a little bit emotional there at the end. Reached the summit of Everest. But um, yeah, that's fun. So you could do that on one of your local hills. Just set these challenges. I mean, while we're locked down, you've got nothing else to do. And the point is this ultra endurance strength will allow you to stay in control. Like I said before, when that summit day, you know, it takes a lot longer than you anticipated. And then you'll still have that extra margin. Or having that ultra endurance fitness will allow you to fit more into like a short weather window. Maybe you've only got a day off work, but you still want to do some climb. Uh, or, or the, the weather is coming in and squeezing in the approach and the descent all into one push, then you'll get more climbing done. And then you won't have to carry bivy gear, so it's a win-win. Uh, and I was going to talk about mental training just very briefly because we're on the topic of training. Uh, I would just recommend this book called The Rock Warrior's Way. Um, my my mentor on the Alpine team, he, Matt Scholes, he put me onto this, and it was a great recommendation because 
as soon as you read this book, you'll 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 be at the crag and you'll all of a sudden notice all those things that people say um, that are just holding them back. They'll say things like, "Oh, there's no footholds. Oh, I'm too short. I can't reach that next hold." Oh, there's no way this is only a grade 17. Or, oh man, I wish I had a just one more 0 0.5 cam. And you'll you read this book and realize that all these kind of behaviors are just wasting mental energy. And instead of saying, oh, I wish I had another 0.5 cam, you could be you're wasting time. You could be thinking, okay, what gear have I got? Okay, I've got. Point four and a and a one. Where where could I possibly put that in, or where's the next hold? Maybe I can just climb through to the next gear placement, or okay, there's no footholds. How can I possibly use the footholds that are there, or smear my foot better on the footholds that don't exist, or maybe you realize okay, this is actually too dangerous. Is this too dangerous? Should I turn back? You know. You read this book and you'll you'll get all those extra little techniques for training the mind, and um, yeah, it's a really really useful book. Um, I think I've already covered um, tr training ideas for Auckland. Yeah, I've already already been through that. Um, and the last part. Almost at the end, and then we can do some questions. Um, the last part is rest and recovery. I've got a quote. It says, training makes you weaker, not stronger. It's during recovery that you become stronger. So you need to listen to your body for when you need that rest. You don't want to just train yourself to oblivion because you'll end up injured or burnt out, you know. You need enough rest. So this is us having a little rest on um, the descent from a mountain because we realized, hey, I think we take a take the time to melt some snow, rest, drink some tea, and recover a bit. We'll we'll be in a much better state for the descent. So that's resting on a route, but um, in general, resting during your training. That also means modulating your training, so you have some weeks which are really hard and then other weeks that are easy, so you have like a rest week. Or even within the week, you have some really hard days and then you have some easier days. So I think there's this adage they say, make your hard days hard and your easy days easy. So you don't want to end up too much in this soft middle ground where your hard days are not so hard because you weren't rested uh, and then you don't want to make your easy days too hard because then you won't be recovered for the next one the next hard one so that's one of those key principles is modulating hard easy and having enough rest in between and in terms of recovery my um my favorite go-to is is it's all about nutrition. So uh, I go for a, a fruit smoothie with the protein powder at the end. So you can get those bags of frozen sm frozen fruit and just smash one of those with the extra protein powder when you finish, and you just recover so much better if you have it within half an hour of finishing that run or training session. And it tastes great. And then of course get your eight hours sleep, and you'll be you'll be a machine. So I want to start wrapping up. We've been through a lot of uh, ideas about training. Um, I've been I've tried not to make it too scientific because there's that's what textbooks are for. This is all about just motivating you guys. And the last thing that I want to make you think about again is what are your mountaineering goals for the future? What are your dreams? What's your dream climb for the for the summer, 2020 or maybe next year? And then you have to think about how you're going to get yourself from where you are now to where you want to be and what 
you're going to do in order to get yourself there because you don't want to be getting to the base of that mountain with like all these what ifs scenarios in your head you want to be getting to the base of the mountain thinking yes I'm strong I'm fit um, I've trained for this and then you'll just deal with whatever happens on the route it'll give you that mental edge you know I think again reading from the book of Twite he says the harder I am to crack I can't actually remember the quote he says you want to be a hard nut to crack because the mountains can be brutal as we know <clears throat> You want to get to that mountain feeling strong and then you take what comes. But the objective at the end of all this is to climb that route. Get to the summit, take that deep breath, and then you look out to the horizon, the sun still high in the sky, and that's because you moved quickly and efficiently, didn't have to stop too long, and then you realize, sweet. I've still got heaps of energy to get back down, heaps of daylight. And that's the real goal at the end of this. To get to the summit, 